Okay. All right. Should I start now? Yes. Okay, great. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, for the National Art Club's at home program. My name is Chindao Glasgow. I am a member of the National Arts Club and on the Architectural Committee. I am the co chair of that committee, and I'm very happy to introduce my first uh, program for the lecture, hopefully not my last. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can vis visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, we are pre presenting that on, I think, all of those programs today. And if you could like um, or join, for instance, on YouTube, uh, it helps us, all right? Uh, following the discussion will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. Uh, on behalf of the Architecture Committee, it is my pleasure to introduce Michael Adlerstein. Uh, this is a program we would have been wanting to do for quite some time. Uh, everybody has probably seen the renovations. So I'll tell you a little bit about Mr. Adlerstein. In 2007, United Nations Secretary General Ban Mi Ki-moon appointed Mr. Adlerstein as the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations for the $2 billion renovation to the UN headquarters in New York, also called the Capital Master Plan. Uh, previously, Mr. Adlerstein served as the Chief Historical Architect for the National Park Service. During his National Park Service career, he was the Project Director for the Restoration of Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty and managed many complex partnership projects, including Gettysburg, Valley Forge, Acadia, and Jamestown. He participated with the U.S. State Department on many international preservation consultancies, including the Taj Mahal in India. He currently teaches sustainable retrofits at Columbia University. And so without further ado, please take it away, Mr. Adlerstein. Thank you. I wanna thank the National Arts Club where I, for many years I was a member uh, until I moved into the suburbs uh, and specifically Nadine Heidinger and Chen Dao for inviting me to speak here this evening. The UN is a very unique uh, organization, even architecturally. It is the most well-known and recognized building from the modern era in the world. But of course, its fame is not architectural. It was, uh, I was selected as, as Chen said, uh, back in 2006 to manage the restoration of the UN, which had been discussed for the previous 10 or 15 years and finally became possible in 2006 and seven. And I stayed on to manage the project through 2017. Uh, I, uh, the, the UN, which is now 75 years old, is very complicated and renovation of the UN was a very complicated project, but it's best to start by looking at the UN's birth. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can do this transfer now. Uh, here we go. The story of the UN really starts with World War I. Uh, back uh, when World War I started, there had never been a world war. Wars were between two or three or 10 countries. Uh, they were, there were 
uh, about 50 countries at the time and about 140 uh, smaller countries that were called colonies of the countries. World War I was a terribly bloody, miserable uh, uh, event. It was the bloodiest event, of, the bloodiest war event in the history of mankind. And it led to the League of Nations. It led to an attempt after the war to find a way for countries to talk to each other uh, rather than fighting each other, to have a dialogue, to try to secure peace before it broke out into warfare. The League of Nations failed for many reasons and it led to World War II uh, within just a couple of decades. And after World War II, which was even bloodier and more miserable than World War I, uh, these two gentlemen, Mr. Roosevelt, President Roosevelt and, Ch and Churchill, who were on the winning side of the war, decided that they can't, con the world can't continue doing this. And they decided to initiate an effort to have a United Nations, they coined the phrase, uh, that would try to avoid World War III. There was a, uh, a vote in London to let the host country uh, be the, uh, the host of the, the host to let the host country for the UN be the United States, and thereafter, this soon developed, as everything in America, a huge real estate battle between Philadelphia, San Francisco, uh, New York, Boston, and uh, several other cities. In who would get the UN as, uh, and they they all had design competitions, and they made very generous offers, and then. John Rockefeller stepped in. This is John Rockefeller Jr. Um, shaking hands with the first Secretary General, Trig Van Lee. And in the on to his to his right, to our left, is Bill Zeckendorf, who was the owner of a property on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. He was built, he was developing, he was uh, a set, uh, collecting the properties, which were a bunch of factories and docks and arranging for a housing project. It was going to be upscale housing on the east side. And Mr. Rockefeller decided to offer the UN the opportunity to put their, to put their house over there. And he gave Mr. Trig Van Lee a $7 million check, which was quickly passed on to Mr. Zeckendorf. The United Nations organized through Trig Van Lee this incredible team of, of uh, wonderful architects from all over the world. Uh, the in the front row, I don't know if this pointer works for you, everyone. This is Mr. Lee from China, Oscar Niemeyer from Brazil, Mr. Cormier from uh, France, uh, and then Wally Wally Harrison, who was uh, the Harrison Abramowitz, were from the United States. The Two architects who played the largest role in the design of the UN was Le Corbusier over on the left-hand side with the glasses uh, over here, if that works, and Oscar Niemeyer. And they took the lead role. Le Corbusier was the old man of architecture in the world from France and Oscar Niemeyer was the young, was the young chap who was uh, coming up in the ranks of, of the modern movement and doing outstanding things. And they, uh, for four months, this team of very talented architects led by uh, Wally Harrison ran through uh, charrettes, ran through designs where they used this, uh, they, they used the clay model system, which was the easiest system to use in those days. And they, they made clay models every week of different designs by each of them. And eventually they came to within about three months uh, uh, the plan for the UN, which is what we see today on the East River. After about three or four months, they turned the project over to Wally Harrison's firm, who designed the, the construction documents for the building, and uh, the building started going up. They started with the Secretariat, and they built the other buildings around it. Uh, one thing that became very classical about the UN, and was it was they brought to America the glass curtain wall. As you can see on the construction, the, uh, the columns were set back from the face of the building. The slabs go right past the columns. 
the columns and then the glass was placed attached to the slabs so that the glass when it would go on afterwards would act as a curtain uh, hung from each slab uh, and that it would uh, give the building a sense that no other building had in America at the time. It, and it actually became a cartoon in the New Yorker where the glass facade was totally like a, a, like a suit of clothing uh, on the building. Of course, you, all buildings had structural systems that were visible until they developed. This was actually done in, in Europe on a smaller scale in a few buildings and Lever House on Fifth Avenue uh, was, the, was the, doing their building at the, about the same time. When it was finished, the building was this very sleek uh, glass facade with no structural system showing. Uh, Le Corbusier insisted on the very skinny uh, silhouette of the building facing uh, both north and south. And uh, you can see underneath the building is the FDR Drive, the highway underneath uh, that runs uh, along the East River in Manhattan. And, uh, and has become only since the recent era has become a security hazard for the UN, which sits right on top of the east of the FDR Drive. The UN during uh, uh, its normal life has many functions that are extremely important for world peace. One, and, uh, Nelson Mandela uh, is typical. World leaders come to the UN every September for the general debate. It used to be 40 countries, uh, 40 world leaders or their foreign ministers or their representative, but usually it was the leaders because it was the United Nations. And it was considered to be such an important organization to, to maintaining peace. And the world leaders got a chance to talk to, to, talk to their, to their uh, home crowd. The television cameras were running, but they also got a chance to talk to each other. It went on for two weeks and they had a chance to have lunch and share thoughts and have negotiations, which each of them, which is very unusual to get so many world leaders in the same space. The UN has grown over time from being 50 countries to being 193 countries. It used to be 50 countries with 143 colonies, and now it is 193 countries. Besides talking to each other, the UN provides food to the hungry all over the world that is placed from various disasters which are consistently happening. We feed about 100 million people a day uh, all over the world in the various refugee camps and in the places where they can, uh, uh, when they're trying to escape or when they're on the road, we provide food as much as possible. We also uh, supervise elections all over the world. We manage countries leading up to elections, trying to encourage them to join the democracies of the world. We get, when they, when they get far enough organized that they can have an election and they, and they have the skills to run a country, uh, which coming out of the colonial era was sometimes took uh, a generation to develop a leadership structure so that they could run their own country, but the uh, but the the UN would manage and supervise their elections to try to make sure that it was as fair as possible. They also take care of disasters when there's earthquakes or or political violence or uh, other kinds of violence. The UN steps in with their support, uh, which they provide to all countries in the world. And of course, in the recent era, this has become very obvious. We manage the refugee crises. The refugees are caused by a variety of, of political events. Many of them are now being caused by climate change and the change in the, and the swap, swapping of some, of some countries with too much water and the, and the expansion of the desert for lack of water. Uh, but the, the, the refugee crisis, as we all know, is on, it's a growing crisis and the UN manages it. Most of the activity of the UN starts in the General Assembly. It is the room that traditionally uh, has, uh, every country has one vote. It's total democracy, it's equality. It has committees which uh, take care of the different, uh, the different requirements of their, of their special needs of each of the funding uh, requirements for women, for child soldiers, for the different, uh, for disasters. Uh, 
the only thing that's not discussed in the General Assembly, the only part of it that's not discussed is the part that caused the, uh, the failure of the League of Nations and led to World War II uh, is the warfare and the, and the ability to avoid war cannot be done in a totally democratic atmosphere. Uh, everyone, uh, everyone with an equal voice never leads to a conclusion on, on issues as violent and as, tr as, as critical as warfare. The, warf the UN provides the blue helmets. We have uh, over 100,000 blue helmets out in the field uh, every day. They're, they they supervise the peace. These are peacekeepers, and that they come in after the UN, after a uh, a, a, a war has been resolved at least uh, temporarily for with a treaty or with a peacekeeping moment. Uh, we send in our peacekeepers. This gentleman is from India, as it says on his shirt. The peacekeepers are all members of national armies all over the world. It's generally managed in a way that armies from Asia serve in Africa or South America, and armies from Africa serve in Asia or, in, or someplace else. And we try to keep the, the peacekeepers away from being captured because they have, uh, which would, uh, in the early years of the UN, we found that many of the peacekeepers were from tribes who were bickering in that area of the world and therefore were causing, were getting into trouble. Uh, so now we separate the geographies. The part that we learned from the failure of the League of Nations is that we need to have a Security Council. The Security Council chamber uh, is 15 countries rather than 193 countries. It has five permanent members, which were the main winners of World War, of World War II. Uh, and they are the uh, France, Britain, uh, the United States, China, and Russia. And those are the permanent members. They have a veto so that nothing could happen in the Security Council about war or peace without the support of, uh, of the majority, but without the veto of the, of the, P5, of the permanent five. The other 10 members of the Security Council are chosen every year, two from each region. There are five regions of the world that the UN uh, has divided the world into. And then the way the seating works is that the horseshoe table uh, has uh, the two seats at the very ends of the table, the two ends are the, are the, uh, are the, the, the bickering parties sit at those two pairs of seats. And then the member states are alphabetical and the chairman changes every month. Uh, and his job is really just to say it's time for lunch. Uh, they, they do not try to manage the discussion. The, this, the discussion happens uh, uh, by a rate, you raise your hand and the chairman will, uh, will pick you uh, in, in an alphabetical order. The system works, uh, uh, but, it's old, but, but, the, but the house is old. The, the electronics uh, were uh, running at it, or were very aged after 70 years and after 60 years. The infrastructure was getting very aged. There was a need for an upgrade to the whole system. The uh, capital master plan was discussed uh, for about 10, 15 years, and then 9-11 uh, happened. And uh, Mayor Giuliani, who was a good mayor when he was a mayor, uh, came over to the UN and discussed with us the, uh, the need for an upgrade. He, he informed us that he lost a thousand firefighters and policemen and a whole bunch of, of wonderful people from New York City. And the UN was a target and the UN doesn't meet code in any way. It met code in 1951 when it opened, but it hasn't been inspected since 1951, uh, over 50 years without an inspection. And, uh, and we have not had a lot of money to maintain our facilities. Uh, like a lot of organizations, all of our money goes into the, the mission that we're doing out in the field. So it needed, it, it needed an upgrade. So we, uh, we started the capital master plan. And one of the things that we needed to do was empty the building. In order to empty the building, we, uh, 
this, we, we decided to use the North Lawn. The North Lawn was originally developed by Le Corbusier in, in the model of the, of the modern movement, which allowed for a place to breathe so that the diplomats can get out. When they go out of the conference rooms, they, could, uh, they can see what they had to see uh, and, get their, and get a sense to, uh, to put their thoughts together. We took the North Lawn. We built a temporary building on the North Lawn uh, in order to house the major conference rooms and the Secretary General's office. And we did tear it down. We promised to tear it down at the end of the project and we did tear it down. But it while we're, it was in use, it had a small, it had a, uh, it had a room which only had a, 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 a one story height. It didn't have the grandeur of the General Assembly room, but it was the place where the General Assembly met for one year during the uh, time that the General Assembly Hall was under renovation. Uh, and that while the while the swing space, we also rented a million square feet of swing space out in Midtown Manhattan. And then we emptied the secretariat and we tore the whole building uh, from the inside out. We, we took all the mechanicals, all the electricals, uh, we tore it all down, we down to slab to slab. We took all the, there was, uh, there was 70 years of soot from the Con Ed plant just a few blocks south of us on 38th Street. So the soot had to be, the whole building was cleaned. And then we removed all the glass and uh, put, in a new, put in new glazing that uh, matched the color and uh, specificity, uh, uh, this, the color and transparency of the, of the original glazing. However, it was, far stronger, more, more sustainable. It was double glazed. Uh, it was also blast resistant and bulletproof where it needed to be. And eventually we put the, we put the new glazing on and we had this wonderful new but restored building. We took the old office space, which was 1950s and beautiful metal furniture from the 1950s, but it was all small offices. Uh, the windows were not shared. The, the senior officials were on the window walls and everyone else was towards the middle of the building. We opened it up during the renovation so that every, we, we moved towards open office furniture and open office space, which allowed everyone to share not just the views, which were very important to give everyone a sense of where they live, but also shared the light and allowed us to share the air conditioning and heating so that we were able with the, with, the, with the new glazing and with the new office layouts, we were able to cut our energy consumption by 50%. We also had conference floors. We, we, we had originally had conference rooms for each department of the UN and we moved to centralized conference floors with computer, with computer uh, reservation systems. The General Assembly uh, needed to be totally rearranged. It was now, it was built for 50 nations and now we had 193 nations and we, we slowly over the course of the 50 years, we were diminishing the number of seats that each country would have, which was not the way to solve the problem. We needed to increase the amount of, the amount of space that was used for the members. So we, we took away one of the balconies from underneath the view you're seeing here and uh, spread the ground floor all the way to the back of the house, making room for 193 countries. In order to do that, we gutted the room, took everything out, moved everything, everything went to cabinet makers to uh, uh, allow the uh, cabinets to be recycled. We, re we reused all the, all the uh, fine materials from the building. We, scaffolded the entire building inside and out in order to uh, take care of the air conditioning and heating vents up above. We moved all the, uh, we moved all the uh, air conditioning to under the floor uh, and we moved the lobbies. We cleaned up all the lobby space. These are Oscar Niemeyer's beautiful lobbies that he designed. He later went on to design Brasilia using these very similar shapes and curves, uh, which was, this was Oscar Niemeyer's interpretation of the marble uh, entrances to the great capitals of Europe, but done with simple shapes and with free forms. And even the entry stairs, which are the 
the sort of mechanical looking bridge uh, in the background was was a replication of the uh, in the modern within the modern movement of using uh, new materials and new shapes. Uh, the lobbies for the visitors were also uh, very modernized with uh, with fluorescent lighting, which are now LEDs. There's a very, there's a very interesting uh, technique that Oscar Niemeyer used, and the whole team, I give Oscar Niemeyer the credit for this building, but actually it was the entire team. Uh, but this room, he, he, he was always concerned that the building was not uh, large enough for the capital of the world, and he wanted to make it feel bigger. So he used some optical illusions. The floor on the main floor of this, uh, this is the General Assembly building, the floor slopes upward and the ceiling slopes downward uh, in this view. You can't, you, you don't feel it, you don't see it, but the, but the, far, the far columns look much more distant than the near columns. It's an optical illusion. They only go, the ceiling drops seven inches. The floor raises seven inches between this point and the far end, but that 14 inches changes the perspective and gives, and the Greeks uh, did this on a lot of their columns and their big temples uh, in ancient Greece and Oscar Niemeyer used their technique. So this is the Security Council chamber. Uh, before we renovated it, it was uh, quite a beautiful room. It was, uh, it was the most uh, traditional room in the UN. A lot of the other rooms were very playful and, uh, and, and very energy, uh, enthusiastic and the the Security Council is so serious that the the Norwegians who designed the room uh, decided to use the most uh, traditional techniques of having a large mural uh, picturing war on war down at the bottom of the mural and peace up above and having very uh, very uh, quiet fabrics uh, in order to in order to do the renovation, we had to get the Security Council out of their room. So we had to build a, a secondary Security Council. We did it in one of, the, one of the vacant conference rooms and we built a Security Council. We put in a 25% image of the painting that was in the real Security Council. This is not a tall room like the real Security Council, but we moved the table over, over one weekend. We moved the table and the meetings of the Security Council never paused. They came to this room uh, right from their room, where, which is now, be, which was during this period of time, was being gutted up above them. We uh, then were gutting the real Security Council, and the uh, this shot is from the Security Council entrance, as it was gutted like the like all the conference rooms. Uh, the wallpaper in this, the wall fabric in the Security Council was very beautiful fabric by Norway. They reopened the mill where the original fabric was was uh, was uh, woven, and they uh, it shows the anchor of stability, which is very important in the Security Council chamber, the hearts of compassion, and the food, uh, the grain of nourishment for the for the vi uh, victims of aggression. And this is the re, re, this is the renewed Security Council. It's the same painting. It, we took off a layer of nicotine. We we put LED lighting and brought in. You can see on the ground, on, within the rug, some of the uh, some of the uh, air conditioning uh, louvers that are coming in through the floor now. We're only cooling the bottom six feet of the room. The temperature up above gets to be 80, 90 degrees, but uh, the air conditioning is coming in from underneath which saves, uh, saves a lot of the cooling energy. The trusteeship council chamber is the second of the very critical chambers. Uh, there's three critical chambers. The trusteeship council is where the colonies, the trusteeships would come and sit on those five chairs in the middle of the horseshoe and, uh, and tell the member states, the 50 member states about how bad life was, how their uh, and uh, this is actually one of the shots. This is uh, the, con the the Belgian Congo, which is no longer which is now the which is now the Congo. Uh, and this is uh, Mr. Uh, President Kabila's father, who was who was a guerrilla leader. He came to the UN to testify about the atrocities of the of the of the Belgian government that they were raping 
the Congo women, that they were using child, children soldiers from the, from the, from the Congo. Uh, and they, what the ritual was that the colonies would come after being colonized for 70 years or 100 years or 200 years, uh, and, and the colonies would complain to the UN. They finally had a place they can talk about their hardships and they would be voted in this room into a recommend, recommendation to the General Assembly for a vote on their freedom. 143, uh, 143 countries were created in this room out of, the, out of the colonies and it was largely bloodless. These were, uh, it was done in a way that was uh, organized by, this, by the UN body, which gave it a credibility. Uh, a few countries had civil wars, like Nigeria had a terrible civil war afterwards, and many, several countries had a fight within the country over who was the leader and which was the stronger tribe, and it went on in several countries, but the countries were not fighting countries, and it wasn't, uh, un it wasn't wild conflict like it, it might have been. This is the trusteeship council after the renovation. Uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, Danes were the original designers of the security of the trusteeship council. They placed this wonderful work of art of this woman calling for freedom, which became the, the colonies calling for freedom. We've kept the the bird is still there and the woman is still there. This is the council in use. It has become, now that the colonies are no longer in existence, this has become the venue for many of the UN debates. Uh, and it, it is, uh, and climate change is very often discussed in, in this room as the conference room. These are all conference rooms of the General Assembly. The third conference room is called ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Chamber, where the major money for disasters and for the tragedies of the world is distributed. The member states come to this room. Uh, the, the General Assembly assigns an overall budget for each type of use, and then the member states divvy it up in this room over which country gets which piece of the pie. There's a lounge. There's a wonderful lounge, the North Lounge, which was... Uh, uh, the place where you go for there's a bar in the back of the room and this is a place where you go in between meetings and after meetings and it was a very active place uh, is it was part of our renovation the dutch made a gift to the project and they were given the uh, they were given the authority to decorate the room it was decorated by rem kuhas who was they they selected rem who's a dutch architect and this was uh, the, the 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 design that rem has provided us uh, all the details of the buildings have been have, have been restored uh, truthfully, so that the fonts and the letter types of the and the clocks and the the woodwork has all been restored to its previous condition, uh, like this. The uh, the uh, a lot of the desks had ashtrays. Smoking was ubiquitous. Uh, so that we've removed all the ashtrays and some little speaker systems, and they've all become, after the furniture has been refinished, all the furniture, uh, all these openings have been used as uh, chargers for your, for your iPads and different electronic devices. The doors have all been polished. There's a wonderful collection of art in the UN. This is a Norman Rockwell, the, uh, the Family of Man, which he did for the, for the United Nations. There's art by uh, 50 or 60 different member states. There's a couple of hundred works of art in the UN. Chagall did a, uh, uh, did a beautiful uh, stained glass window, which is uh, a full story high of the dark world on the right bef uh, before the UN. And then the UN is the tree in the middle and then the light, the world uh, with happy little cows and sheep running around. Uh, is on the left side of the, of the Chagall stained glass window. This is uh, the Japanese Peace Bell, also considered one of the works of art. The Japanese Peace Bell uh, was, was uh, uh, wrought out of the pennies provided by the children, the surviving children of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the atom bomb. They donated pennies that were cast into this bell the bell is rung uh, in October on the day that the bomb was that the bomb was dropped on those two cities, and uh, and the emperor or the prime minister 
uh, come over and with all the school children from all over New York City come around to celebrate uh, the, the peace and the abolition of, of nuclear weapons, or at least in the use of nuclear weapons. This is uh, very interesting from the Soviet Union, which now is now called Russia, or part of it is called Russia. And the Soviet, this is St. George slaying the dragon. The dragon is laying down, and the dragon's body is two nuclear missiles, one from the Soviet Union and one from the United States. Of course, the, the, uh, the, the warheads are, are, not in the, are not in the lawn next to the UN. It's just the, it's just the body of the missile, but symbolically it's a very powerful St. George slaying the dragon. And Picasso's uh, uh, Guernica is sitting outside the Security Council because it does represent life and death uh, and that it's, it, was, it was purchased from Picasso by the Rockefeller family and it's on long-term loan to the United Nations to sit outside the Security Council. Much of what we did was based on security. Uh, we used to have a lot of dogs that would sniff your bags for uh, drugs or, or dynamite uh, or guns, but now it has gotten much more sophisticated. So we've had to reinforce the entire FDR drive. As I pointed out to you, we are built on top of the FDR drive. So we've heavily reinforced the drive in case anyone gets bad ideas about uh, doing something to the UN. We've built, a, we surrounded the UN with these bollards which protected from uh, trucks and other uh, types of uh, bombs. We've been hit. Uh, Several times in recent years, as everyone knows, we were hit in Algeria, we, we've been hit in, in Beirut. Uh, thousands of UN employees have died uh, from terrorism and from uh, other, and from uh, being in the, in the, in the, uh, in, in the midst of, of fighting. Uh, so we, we, do, uh, we did spend a lot of money and a lot of effort on trying to protect our UN and our delegates. We have, the, we have uh, state-of-the-art data centers. Uh, so the project was, uh, was finished uh, in 2017. We completed the project within 4% of our $2 billion budget. We had no overnight construction accidents. We had no financial scandals. We were on schedule and for the 2017 UN general debate, the, Ge the General Assembly was back in operation. We cut the energy and the carbon production by 50% of the UN. We recycled 95% of the waste and the project achieved leads for those, for those of you in the audience who are architects and or engineers and understand the leads rating systems. We, we reached leads gold overall and leads platinum for the secretariat. And the, uh, and, the, and the organization never had to close for even a day. I'm just gonna speak for a moment about climate change. It is such a uh, critical issue uh, that uh, I do want to at least touch on it. We, uh, we know from uh, the studies that have been done that climate change is accelerating and it's, it's become more uh, prominent. We know that buildings account for roughly half of the carbon, uh, half the energy that's consumed and half the carbon that goes up into the sky. Uh, that's both the construction of buildings as well as the operation of buildings. So uh, architects take a, uh, are responsible for a, a big chunk as well as everybody in the world uh, because everybody uses buildings. So we're all, we, are, we are hoping that we do something about recycling more buildings and using and building less new buildings. I think uh, Everyone would recognize this city. There's a tower over there on the left, the Eiffel Tower. This is Paris. Paris, for totally different reasons, put a, put a lid on their, on their city and said, we're not gonna build anymore. We're not gonna tear down anything. We're gonna build out there in the distance where you can see some skyscrapers. And Paris has been the most successful city in the world. Vienna and some other European cities are also uh, have, have very modest amounts of new construction, 
we in America tear down our cities every 20 years and we and build new buildings all the time. So it's a very different attitude. But Paris has, has found that they are the most successful tourist attraction and that therefore a very lucrative city by looking and feeling like old Europe and that they are, they have wonderful, of course they have, they have good food and they have, they have wonderful appeal, but it, having taken the decision for, for reasons of avoiding their own destruction uh, was a wonderful decision that they've done for the world. The climate is moving, the, these, the, uh, the desert areas are expanding and uh, the only hope is that we will all uh, take climate change more seriously and maybe based upon the results that we're seeing from yesterday's election, we can go back to being a, a, a serious uh, member of the world community. Now, if I can stop sharing, there we go. Okay, Nadine or Jen, are we back? Uh... Yes, we're back. Uh, so we do have some questions. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, this is, I think, the 75th anniversary of the UN, so it's, it's very timely. Um, I wanted to ask some of these questions. Uh, the first one, I know you showed us the lounge and the bar, um, but does the UN have um, restaurants, cafes, uh, that sort of thing to help the people who work there? Yes, we have a variety of, uh, of eating venues. We have a delegates dining room, which is open for the staff. It's a little bit expensive, but it's very nice dining up on the fourth floor of the over the conference rooms. We also have uh, three or four different cafeterias for the for everyone. Uh, so there's a variety of food. We uh, we started off with uh, very little food, but we found that people would have to. First Avenue was not developed and didn't have restaurants, so uh, so that restaurants were developed within the UN, which became very uh, efficient for saving people's time. I could imagine. Thank you. Uh, Another really good question, which I thought about as well while you were presenting, uh, I, I think you said the renovations were two billion dollars. But how was the were the renovations funded? The uh, all funding for the UN, not all funding, the majority of the funding for the UN is done by a assessment based upon your each country's slice of the world product. The the, uh, so that uh, the United States generates the highest percent of the world product, which is 22% that we produce. We, we have 22% of the economic might of the world. And then uh, China has around 20%. And then, uh, and of course, this is pre-pandemic. I don't know what the numbers are now, but, uh, but, uh, but the, the percent of the world product tells you your percent of, the, of how you're assessed. So the United States contributes 22% of the cost of the UN, China 20%, Japan, Germany, and it goes, it goes down uh, to the, the, the largest 40 countries contribute about 95 or 96 percent of the entire uh, cost of the UN. And then the 100 and uh, 140 or so other countries, smaller countries, uh, each get assessed about a half of a, uh, about a half of, of a percent. Wonderful. Thank you. Who is the, uh, another question, who was the Norwegian architect of the Security Council? You know, I was looking for uh, yeah, Arnstein, Arnstein Arnberg, uh, who, was a, who was very famous in Norway, and he did, uh, he did the Security Council. He also did the City Hall in downtown, in downtown uh, Oslo, uh, which I went to visit uh, while I was working on the project, because he did play a very prominent role uh, and, uh, and the other rooms are much more uh, modern movement and happy and joyful. And, uh, but he decided, and the Norwegian government decided that the Security Council, which is 
called the most important room in the world. It is the room where war and peace is decided on a daily basis. And it, it, is, it does have amazing activities that go on there. And I, I wanted to, while I'm on this, I do want to say that the UN uh, considers itself, the member states consider that the UN is, is generally a phenomenal success because we haven't had World War III. And you know, of course, the absence of, of something, like any absence, is hard to take note of. But we did have world wars, and we did have serious wars for the previous millenniums of life of civilized humans. We're very warlike people, and that's in our, it's in our brain someplace. Uh, and since the UN, there's been multiple wars. There've been big wars like the Vietnam War, and the, but the big powers talk to each other at the UN, and we don't we don't face each other on the battlefields since the UN was created, uh, which is one of the reasons why the Security Council is very protective of not changing anything. They do think it works, and once you change the formula, when you let uh, there's always a move to make the Security Council a little more inclusive. Let some of the other, let some of the other major countries like Germany or Japan or India or some of the other major powers they should join. But the fear is that when the door is open, it'll be hard to close the door, and we will have another League of Nations, and there will be uh, uh, there will be chaos because when everyone when too many when there's too many voices in the room, and there's uh, it, it doesn't work, as we've seen in Congress, and we've seen in many ways. All right, thank you. Yeah. Some uh, general questions, uh, or more specific, who is the artist of the mural in the General Assembly Hall? Uh, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but I will, uh, I'll let you know, Chen, I'll send you an email. <laughs> okay. it's, one of, it's one of the books up here. Sure, I'll post it on the on the YouTube chat. Um, okay. All right, uh, could you please talk about the curtains in the Security Council? Are they ever opened? Uh, when and by whom? The the, the curtains. Well, yeah. you know, uh, Oscar Niemeyer designed the conference building to look out on the East River, which was a beautiful river, and and it had the farms of Queens in the distance when it was built. Uh, and then over the first five years of the UN, the television was invented and back in the 1950s. And the television lighting required, uh, it, they found that without curtains, that the sun would put certain countries in favor and certain countries in shadow, and that the television camera, since they all participate in discussions, some of these ambassadors would have, uh, they didn't like sitting alphabetically. They wanted, they wanted, the powerful ambassadors wanted to sit where there was sunlight. And so therefore they decided to artificially light everyone and move, close the, close the curtains, never open them. And they're always closed because of the, because of everything in the UN is televised. Everything is documented and televised. And this way everyone's equal in the light. That's amazing. I don't think we would have found that out from anybody else. Uh, right. Well, we, we, yeah. we tried very hard to, uh, to get rid of the curtains so that there'd be views at times, but the UN protocols, uh, that it, it's, a, it's an organization which, has, which is seeped in protocol, like any Congress in any country, uh, but the protocol was never touch the curtains. Just, there, there were terrible disputes in the early days of the powerful countries wanting seats in sunlight, and and then they would sit in front of the windows. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. Um, there was talk at one time of turning the UN into a hospital. Uh, are you familiar with that? Can you talk about that? Of the UN being turned into a hospital? Right. Oh, uh, no. There was, there was talk about on Ellis Island of using the old hospital, but I'm not aware of the UN being, uh, of any discussion about the UN being turned into a hospital. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is an excellent question. 
uh, after completion of the renovation, uh, what would you have done differently? Well, I might not have taken the job. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I think it was a one. Don't, don't take the job at all. Well, it was a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, a, as diverse a culture as the earth could create. I mean, every country in the world is there and they all have a chance to criticize you. I, I would testify for what, for the the financial committee, which is called the fifth committee or the general assembly uh, several times a year. And there was all, it would always be, uh, sometimes terribly, uh, terribly difficult uh, because people have attitudes about America, people have attitudes about uh, the, the, UN, the UN leadership so that uh, it was, a, it was uh, testy. But I do think, uh, I can't think of, uh, I can't think of anything I would have done differently. It was very, I had wonderful, I, I didn't give enough credit to the team of consultants and engineers and staff, we had, the UN staff was was fabulous. I inherited the staff that was put together before I got there, and it was a wonderful staff. And we borrowed a couple of lawyers from the legal department, and we borrowed a couple of IT people from the IT department. And it was a very very uh, wonderful staff of architects from the facilities department, and, uh, and it worked very well. And we had and we had a great, we had a great team of consultants. Excellent. Another good one here. Uh, does the renovation address modern standards of accessibility? Yeah, we are. We met the international code of accessibility. Actually, uh, Europe is far ahead of us in terms of accessibility, ahead of the United States. So we met the U.S. code. We also uh, met the international code for uh, in all ways. We try to always uh, meet the international code, but always uh, and. Uh, but we tried to meet the international code, but we always did meet at least the New York City and, and American code because we did want to promise the mayor back there 15 years ago, we did promise the mayor that we'd, we would restore the building to, to meet code so his firefighters would be safe. Great. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of a two-part question. Um, I'm, I'm com combining two questions. Um, so... Um, what have you, what has been done about COVID in the UN and when the quarantine's over, will there be tours of the UN again? Uh, when COVID is over, we, uh, hopefully it's going to be, uh, within our lifetimes and that, uh, we will, the UN will, I am confident the UN will go back to being open to the public when it's safe. Uh, when the when the state and the city and the federal government say it's safe and when the UN says it's safe. Right now, the UN is basically operating on a very skeleton crew that stays at, within the compound, including the, uh, including the Secretary General, who's there quite a lot. Uh, but most of the staff is working from home. And uh, technology has advanced to the point where they can do their work from home. Uh, of course, there's a there's a, the the meetings being done this way through zooming and through other computer means are not like the old general assembly. Uh, it, it it shows up in having a much less uh, cordial uh, relationship. Hopefully, this won't go on very long because it does inter interfere with diplomacy. Wonderful. Uh, is there an, an art committee to choose the art? There is an art committee. Uh, there are certain rules. Uh, it changes uh, over time. There was a time when uh, member states were donating uh, uh, portraits of their presidents. And then we, the UN realized, the art committee realized we could be over, uh, there's 196 countries. They change presidents every three or four or five years. We could have thousands of portraits. We could become a portrait gallery uh, and have no room for art, for other arts. So we, we, we don't allow portraits of, of heads of state. There is one portrait which was donated by a Scandinavian country of Nelson Mandela because he was, uh, because of what he did with uh, with his presidency, but he was an, he, he was an exception to all the rules about heads of state. He 
uh, basically turned the other cheek to the abuse that he was subject to. And that's so unusual that uh, he, so his, his portrait is there, but very few other portraits are there. Uh, there is an art committee that does the selection. We now no longer have big wall space because there's tapestries on a lot of the big walls. So now we're asking member states that haven't yet donated art that they are allowed three or four per year uh, to donate art and the art committee selects who. We'll have to get uh, a big gallery. You'll, that'll be your next job to build a big uh, <laughs> museum space as part of it. You know, the UN definitely does not want to go into the art gallery <laughs> <laughs> business. The UN, uh, the art is to make the ambassadors feel at home when they come to the UN. The, uh, the Saudi ambassador goes to the Saudi art. The, uh, all the ambassadors uh, find us, take a seat near their artwork when they, when they wanna to talk to other ambassadors. And, that, and that's the, uh, the they, 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 they donate the art for themselves to make the place feel like home for them, uh, not for the public. Of course, the public is basically American. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's the visitors, we, uh, we encourage international visitors to come to the UN, but a lot of the visitors, our school kids, are, are, are American. Wonderful. I have a, uh, next question is very technical. Actually, it's a, it's a good one and uh, right up my alley as an architect. Uh, which curtain wall system and manufacturer country of production was used and why? For the secretary at the big curtain. Yeah. Well, it's a, uh, we, we looked at, uh, we, a, group of, a group went to uh, Germany where there are uh, tremendous technology with double glaze, triple glazed, double walls, triple walls, uh, right. a whole bunch of varieties of different ways of glazing. And uh, we decided on a double glaze system uh, because of the weight we couldn't, we didn't want to go to something that was extraordinary like triple glazed for the small amount of additional sustainability, uh, but it's a double glaze system. Heinges was the, uh, was the architect who designed the system. Uh, while I mentioned Heinges, HL, our architects, the major consultants that we used was HLW, Perkins, Siskin and Hennessy, uh, uh, and, uh, and Heinges, and, uh, and Heinges designed it and the, the fact, the manufacturer was a joint venture by uh, China participated. Mexico was where the, all the parts came together. Canada supplied the, supplied the aluminum uh, muttons and mullions. Uh, it, the, the insulation was provided uh, by Germany. It was, a, it was a joint venture. We tried to make a lot of our contractual, uh, contractual work to be as international as possible. Yeah, you know, I have to say that uh, that was one of the main things that um, sort of intrigued me and wanted to invite uh, you to lecture on this was that the, it just came out so well. It was like a gleaming gem. It's one of those situations where the the restored uh, product actually, I think, looks a little better than the original. Um, though it's not that different, it just, it was gorgeous. Well, you know, the original was not the original. The original that you saw before the when the UN got beyond being 50 years old was covered in film. They put a film up because the original didn't have any film to keep the windows from getting too hot from the exposure. And it was over overpowering the air conditioning system. So they put a green film on. And then when the when the UN got blasted in a few cities, they the security put another film on top of the film to better secure the glass in case of a truck bomb going off against the UN. So that it, what you were looking at was a uh, a much distorted view of the original glazing. Uh, we have some of the original glazing, which we contributed in, in, in our equitable fashion. We contributed some of the original glazing within their frames to four museums. We gave it to MoMA, we gave it to the Hermitage, we gave it to the Louvre, and, uh, and we gave it to uh, a museum in Japan. I don't remember the name, but we sort of shared the discarded 
glazing, one just one day wide uh, for each of the museums that they would have a piece of the UN. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. Oh, I should mention now that uh, we're we're at time, but um, Mr. Adlerstein has graciously uh, allowed ex for extra time for questions and answers. So welcome to stay on, though I don't think we'll probably go uh, much longer than 10 or 15 minutes more. But I do have um, 14 more questions here, so we'll keep going. Okay. And one attendee. Short. What's that? I'll try to be very short in my answers. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, the UN used to have a lovely cafeteria for staff on the ground floor overlooking the East River. Why was it closed after the renovation? The staff cafeteria and the library building were deemed during our project by our, uh, by our BLAST consultants to be at risk because the FDR drive allows uh, you can get on. Well, I, I won't go into the details because it's a, it's a security problem, but you could uh, blow up the cafeteria from the FDR drive, no matter what we did. We had no control over it. It's controlled by New York City. They refused to uh, take the necessary steps to block access to the off ramp. So, uh, and it, 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 would, it, would, it would be a hassle for them. So we had to we had to take the cafeteria and the library out of use. Uh, it was too exposed to bombs. We, the, the, the bomb threat, and that's why I showed the, what we did under the, uh, what we did under the UN and along, around the UN and other things that we've done with reinforcing the UN, the bomb threat is real. And, uh, and the, the, the threat of terrorism in New York was real. I think it's less real now, but Madison Square Garden did the same thing that we did. All right. Uh, will you be assisting with the UN renovations in Geneva? No. <laughs> no, I've, I've left the UN. I, I, I consult with the UN as needed. I might, I might advise them if, they're, if, I'm, if I'm asked to. It's, it's a very big project. They have very competent people. Now, most of my team is, is uh, moved over to that project and uh, it's moving forward. Uh, so I think uh, there's no need. Thank you. Uh, this question is interesting. Um, could climate change be a major issue addressed in the UN? I think you kind of answered this, um, but wars have been initiated from disasters due to climate change. Have wars been initiated? Is that Actually, it's kind of a statement. Um, yeah. Well, I think I I I, I know that the there there is a sense that the Syrian conflict, the entire Syrian conflict, uh, has something to do with the aquifer dropping by hundreds of feet. That the that the nomadic life in the Syrian desert has not been possible anymore. So that the Syrian refugee crisis in Europe, which which hasn't caused a war, but has caused a lot of violence, uh, was, caused, was caused by climate change. And it's also true in other places. Climate change is causing countries to have to uh, relocate, literally relocate cities or entire populations. So it is, a, it is trauma. And the climate change group at the UN has said that climate the effect of climate change is social unrest. We're not, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna survive long enough to see the end effects of climate change. We will have social unrest in many parts of the world, which will affect the wealthier parts of the world, whether we like it or not. Building a wall at the Mexican border is not gonna stop everyone who needs to, to uh, who, needs, who wants to get away. So climate change is a very, a very significant issue and we think it's only getting worse. Thank you. Uh, was there a discussion of creating more UN buildings on the vacant land south of the HQ complex across 42nd Street? Uh, no, there was a discussion. Uh, that, that property is owned by uh, Sheldon Solo, who's a real estate developer. He bought 
the power plant that used to be there and he demolished it and he was and he plans on building a housing project there he's 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 waiting for the right economic climate i think i'm not sure he at one point was discussing with us doing something cooperatively uh possibly on the property but we're not uh, at the moment he's not doing anything yeah, it's not owned by the city it's owned by a private developer so you would likely have to acquire the property and then expand onto it if they wanted to. I think the UN at the moment is not looking at expanding in New York. The UN is expanding in many, in many cities, uh, but I think at the moment the UN is not, uh, not looking to expand in New York. Thank you. So I have two people ask this question, basically. Uh, during the renovations, were there any unexpected fines? Like, um, you know, I guess that could be one general question, but they specifically, uh, hidden mics, espionage equipment, um, things of that nature. You know, it's a, uh, a question I'm asked quite a lot because we did a lot of demolition in the conference buildings. Uh, I was asked by a, a few governments to turn over any listening devices that we found. And, and I informed our demolition contractors, whatever you find, step on it, throw it in the trash, do not collect them. If we find them on eBay, uh, you'll be sued. Uh, we don't, and, and I, I know that there were many devices found, but I have to say that uh, many of the ambassadors in the UN felt that Secrets are dangerous in international diplomacy. Eavesdropping is helpful. Very often eavesdropping is intentionally, people very often ambassadors will intentionally allow eavesdropping to happen either, either one way or another because it's a way of sharing information without necessarily being responsible for saying, oh, by the way, you know, we're gonna be doing this on that date. So I think that uh, although it is a, it is a crime, and we did we did find devices, but we didn't keep them, and we did we didn't save them. Interesting. That's I think uh, a strategy also used for uh, when asbestos is discovered. You just take it out instead of uh, alerting anyone. So you didn't hear that from me. No, we alerted every. We did. We took out a football field. 15 feet high of asbestos contaminated material, which was all, con which was all disposed of in a proper asbestos contamination uh, facility. Uh, but yeah, but there's a lot of asbestos that was used during the, for, during the 50s and 60s and 70s, and it, it, it was ubiquitous. It was everywhere in the UN. Very good. Uh, this new UN has a LEED certification. The HVAC was mentioned. Is any of that geothermal? No, uh, we don't use geothermal heat. We're trying. To, New York City doesn't uh, wasn't encouraging it when we when we were doing the project, uh, but we uh, we uh, we considered it, and it wasn't it wasn't. Uh, we need we needed uh, we needed. The heat and the cold on a very large scale, which would which would have been very difficult uh, on our small site without putting wells everywhere. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, could you tell us about the UN chapel? Sure. The UN has a small chapel about the size of my living room, and uh, it's it's uh, it's used when UN uh, people uh, die in in, in service. And there's a ecumenical, uh, there's an interfaith ceremony that takes place place there with the Secretary General, and with whichever head of state is involved. And we, uh, it's done ever, or it's done whenever some UN people get killed by in one of these peacekeeping missions. It's a beautiful room. Uh, it's got a uh, one work of art. I don't, I don't. Uh, I'll send you the name of that artist also when I uh, look through the books later tonight. But uh, it's a beautiful little chapel. It's down by, the, it's in the visitor's area. So the, visitor, the visitors can always go there. It's a quiet room and it's, uh, and, and it's also being used sometimes as a Muslim prayer room. 
Uh, what about the rotating exhibits in the General Assembly lobby? What about them? They're run by our Department of Public Information, and uh, they rotate. They're uh, they're discussed by a committee of of uh, for that type of stuff, and they have they have outside advisors, and they have member states on the committee, and they pick out which topics they're going to be doing, and they they set up the exhibits. Great. All right. One final question. Are there any plans to build more on campus uh, from outlying buildings? To build more? Uh, more campus from outlying buildings. No, I, I think that uh, well, the only building that is not yet put back in service is the library. If New York City at some point can do something with the off ramp, uh, that would be great. And then we would be able to uh, make the library safe and then we can restore the library. The, uh, right now the library is a storage building. We have a lot of file cabinets and it's, it's, it's basically dead file space uh, for the UN, but uh, it'd be, it's a great building. And uh, that's, the, that's the only building that's not restored. We're, we're not planning on any new construction in, in, on the grounds. I know. Uh, this is maybe uh, not an architecture question, uh, a last minute one. Uh, would you be in favor of removing the veto power of the five colonial powers? You know, the, uh, the Security Council functions. We haven't had World War III. It is, the, uh, it, is, it is the first time in human history that we've had the major powers of the world, not not go after each other. And, and the UN does believe it's because of the format of that Security Council that uh, if we allowed more members to come in, or if we got rid of the veto, or if we change the procedure so that the powerful countries are not able to get a secure handle on who's making war uh, and, and to discuss it with their, with their colleagues, the five of them, uh, then the UN might not be able to avoid World War III. It's working. The League of Nations failed. I don't think we, I think there's been a, a, many ambassadors which have said, we don't have to prove that it's working because we haven't had a war. And if we get rid of, if we allow more people in or if we change the rules, it'll just be a trap. It, it could be well, a magic moment. I, I guess this is one of the cases where this pun really works. Um, if it's not Baroque, don't fix it. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Okay, because it's modern. Um, so it's modern, right? It's upper. We've we've answered all the questions. Um, I want to thank you so much uh, for this presentation. We've got a lot of fantastic uh, feedback and congratulations uh, on the quality of the presentation in the in the chat. Um, I want to request anybody um, who, who really enjoyed the presentation to hit your like button on Facebook and YouTube or to subscribe to the National Arts Club. And hopefully when COVID is, is over, um, everybody can return to the club for live lectures and we'll be able to offer them our very excellent uh, punch and cookies that we normally have at events. But thanks very much, Michael. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you. And thank Nadine. Yes, and, and yes, thanks the club. Nadine, and thank I, you, I, and thanks the club for everybody for participating. Right, okay.